Hey there everyone, it's Mr. Lane here to give you notes about art from the Roman Empire part two. Take good notes and let's begin. Rome's architectural revolution. Concrete is a substance made of lime mortar, volcanic sand, water, and small stones. It's cheap, less than stone, faster to gather materials, strong and more sturdy, easy to use, and permits greater complexity of forms and spaces like vaults and domes. The new medium became a vehicle for shaping architectural space and enabled Roman architects to design buildings in revolutionary ways. Pont de Garde looking northeast names France around 16 BCE. An aqueduct carries water from mountain sources to their city on the Tiber River. It's an artificial channel for conveying water, typically in the form of a bridge, as you see here, across the valley or other gap. The water flowed over the considerable distance by gravity alone, which required channels built with a continuous gradual decline over the entire route from source to the city. As Rome's power spread through the Mediterranean world, its engineers constructed aqueducts, roads, and bridges to serve colonies throughout the far-flung empire. Arched architecture refers to the use of arches in the construction of buildings and other structures. The earliest form of the arch was an arrangement of masonry stones in a semicircular shape originating from springers, the stones at the base of the arch, rising through a series of vosors and culminating at the keystone, the block that holds the structure in place. Several ancient civilizations understood and utilized arched construction, including those of Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Greece. Easy enough to build, the arch did, however, require wooden centering, an underlying frame that held the pieces of the arch in place until the keystone was installed. Despite the utility of the arch, it was not a widespread feature in ancient architecture until the time of the Romans. Here you see where that construction technique was used on the aqueducts. This is one more view of the aqueducts. Other important architectural features were vaults and domes. A barrel vault is an extension of a simple arch creating a semi-cylindrical ceiling over parallel walls. Groin or cross vault is formed by the intersection at right angles of two barrel vaults of equal size. Fenestrated sequence of groin vaults were advantageous because concrete vaults are relatively fireproof. A hemispherical dome is a round arch rotated around the full circumference of a circle. And lastly, the oculus, Latin for eye. The round central opening of a dome, also a small round window in Gothic cathedrals. Around 64 CE, a fire broke out in central Rome. The fire raged out of control for six days, only slowing down after it had destroyed or gravely damaged seven of the city's 14 districts. Emperor Nero responded quickly to the needs of his people, providing them with emergency food and housing, even opening one of his palaces to the displaced victims. In his first five years as emperor, Nero gained a reputation for political generosity, promoting power 
sharing with the Senate and ending closed-door political trials, though he generally pursued his own passions. Facing certain assassination as a result of his outrageous behavior, he is best known for his debaucheries, political murders, and persecution of Christians. Nero committed suicide in 68 CE. A year of renewed civil strife followed. The man who emerged triumphant in this brief but bloody conflict was Vespasian, whose family name was Flavian. The Flavians left their mark on the capital in many ways, not the least being the construction of the Colosseum, which we'll look at here shortly, which was one of Vespasian's first undertakings after becoming emperor, which was politically driven. The site chosen was the artificial lake on the grounds of Nero's Domus Aurea, which engineers drained to make way for the new entertainment city. Center, entertainment center. By building his amphitheater there, Vespasian reclaimed for the public the land that Nero had confiscated for his private pleasure and provided Romans with the largest arena for gladiatorial combats, gladiatorial combats, and other lavish spectacles over ever constructed. Around 64 CE, a fire broke out in central Rome. The fire raged out of control for six days, slowing down only after it had destroyed or gravely damaged seven of the city's 14 districts. Emperor Nero responded quickly to the needs of his people, providing them with energy, emergency food, and housing, even opening one of his palaces to the displaced victims. In his first five years as emperor, Nero gained a reputation for political generosity, promoting power sharing with the Senate and ending closed door political trials, though he generally pursued his own passions. Facing certain assassination as a result of his outrageous behavior, he is best known for his debaucheries, for example, political murders, and persecution of Christians. Nero committed suicide in 68 CE. A year of renewed civil strife followed. The man who emerged triumphant in this brief but bloody conflict was Vespasian, whose family name was Flavian. The Flavians left their mark on the capital in many ways, not the least being the construction of the Colosseum, which we will look at here shortly, was one of Vespasian's first undertakings after becoming emperor, which was politically driven. The site chosen for the Colosseum to be constructed was the artificial lake on the ground of Nero's Domus Aurea, which engineers drained to make way for the new entertainment center. By building his amphitheater there, Vespasian reclaimed for the public the land that Nero had confiscated for his private pleasure and provided Romans with the largest arena for gladiatorial combats and other lavish spectacles ever constructed. Here's a jumper movie clip you can watch that shows the Colosseum ambush scene. Facade of the Colosseum, also known as Flavian Amphitheater, looking south from Rome, Italy, approximately 70 to 80 CE. Besides Roman law, perhaps Rome's most valuable contributions were in the areas of architecture and engineering. Roman builders not only developed the arch, vault, and dome, but pioneered the creative use of concrete. These innovations proved revolutionary, allowing Romans for the first time to cover immense interior spaces without inner supports. With a million people in Rome, many of them poor, emperors distracted the masses from their grievances with large-scale public entertainment. At the Colosseum, which seated 50,000 spectators. For the opening act in AD 80, the entire arena was flooded to stage a naval battle, reenacted by a cast of 3,000. 
combats between gladiators were also popular. Here are some more fun facts about the Colosseum. Combats between gladiators was popular. Some were armed with shield, sword, and helmet, while others carried only net and trident. Boxers wore leather gloves, their fists clenched around lumps of iron. To guarantee an energetic performance, the combat was to the death. Slaves carrying whips with lead weights on the lashes drove fleeing men abreast back into the fray. Up to 40 gladiators, if the crowd was in a thumbs down mood, died per day. In the course of a single day's event, thousands of corpses were dragged off with a metal hook. Halftime shows featured the execution of criminals, followed by man wild beast contest. Early elevators raised hundreds of starving lions from underground cages to attack unarmed Christians or slaves. Man versus bear struggles were also much admired, as were animal hunts staging starring elephants or rhinoceroses. To celebrate one victory, the Emperor Trajan sacrificed 11,000 lions, leopards, ostriches, and antelopes. To disguise the odor of stables, slaves sprayed clouds of perfume at distinguished spectators and sprinkled red powder on the arena's sand floor to make bloodstains less conspicuous. Next, we will talk about the Emperor Titus, who died during the year 81 CE. The Arch of Titus was dedicated by his brother Domitian. That arch was located on the sacred way leading to the Republican Forum. The triumphal arch celebrates a victory, building of roads or bridges, and celebrating the various successes of the Emperor Titus. Titus also celebrates his victory over Judea, the conquest of Jerusalem, which was extremely bloody and violent. East facade of the Arch of Titus, Rome, Italy, after 81 CE. As on the Colosseum, engaged columns framed the arched opening. Reliefs depicting personified victories, winged women, as in Greek art, filled the spandrels. The area between the arch's curve and the framing columns and a tablature. The inscription on the attic states that the Senate erected the arch to honor the god Titus, son of the god Vespasian, to underscore Titus's divinity. The Senate normally proclaimed Roman emperors gods after they died, unless they had a bad reputation with the Senate in which they were damned. Here's another view of the arch. Spoils of Jerusalem, relief panel in the passageway of the Arch of Titus. The reliefs inside the Bay of the Arch of Titus commemorate the emperor's conquest of Judea. Here, Roman soldiers carry in triumph the spoils taken from the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. One of the reliefs depicts Roman soldiers carrying the spoils, including the sacred seven-branched candelabrum, the monarch, from the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. The style here, you can see strong shadows, the play of light and shadow across the protruding foreground and receding background. The figures enhance the sense of movement. Triumph of Titus. Victory crowns Titus in his triumphal chariot. Also present are personifications of honor and valor in this first known instance of the intermingling of human and divine figures in a Roman historical relief. Now we arrive at the High Empire between 96 and 192 CE. 
the Roman Empire will reach its peak geographically. It will be under the Trajan, Hadrian, and the Antonine family. We will see a continuation of Pax Romana, and Trajan will be the first non-Italian ruler. Social welfare will be at the top of his list. Form of Trajan, Restored View The new form glorified Trajan's victories in his two wars against the Dacians in present-day Romania, the spoils of which paid for Trajan's building program in the capital. Entry to Trajan's forum was through an impressive gateway resembling a triumphal arch. Inside the forum were other reminders of Trajan's military prowess. A larger-than-life-sized gilded bronze equestrian statue was there of the emperor that stood at the center of the great court in front of the basilica. Column of Trajan looking west. Here we see the 128 foot tall Column of Trajan, which once had a heroically nude statue of the emperor at the top. The present statue of St. Peter dates to the 16th century. The tall pedestal, decorated with captured Dacian arms and armor, served as Trajan's tomb. The Column of Trajan is most noteworthy, however, for its spiral frieze, which was often copied in antiquity during the Middle Ages, and is even as late as the 19th century. The spiral frieze of Trajan's column tells the story of the Dacian Wars in 150 episodes. The reliefs depict all aspects of the campaigns from battles to sacrifices to roads and fort construction. Here's one more detail view. Pantheon looking south, Rome, Italy, 118 to 125 CE. Hadrian, Trajan's chosen successor. Everywhere he went, local officials set up statues and arches in his honor. That is why more portraits of Hadrian exist today than of any other emperor except Augustus. Made during Emperor Hadrian's rule, the Temple of All the Gods, one of the best preserved buildings of antiquity and most influential in architectural history. We do not know, we do not have any historical source that gives the name of the architect who in this building revealed the full potential of concrete, both as a construction material and as a means for shaping architectural space. Some have suggested that Hadrian himself designed the building, but if not the emperor, the architect who conceived the Pantheon meant certainly to reflect the stability and strength of the empire during his reign. Here you can see a video titled Pantheon of Rome, Mystery of Ancient Roman Architecture in 3D. The architectural revolution of ancient Rome combine the mastery of the arch and vaulting with the efficiency of concrete construction. It is fitting that the Romans, with their rich civic traditions and organized public life, would demand that buildings be places of Congress and assembly. It is best to discuss the Pantheon as it would have been experienced by visitors in the Roman age. Like many great buildings, it was preceded by a large fort court that served as a spacious place of assembly. Visitors, both worshipers and sightseers, approached the grand entrance from the court, the level of which was considerably lower in ancient times than the ground level in front of the building today. Once inside the temple, the effect on visitors was both surprising and awe-inspiring. 
just as it is for tourists of our time. Passing through majestic bronze doors, the ancient viewer would have entered an enclosed space, the likes and scale of which had no precedent in architectural history. Rising above was the enormous open hemispherical dome soaring to the height of around 142 feet. The width of the interior, because it is based on the dimensions of a spear, is an equal 142 feet across. In its original aspect, the interior would have gleamed with polished marble and other decorative stones inlaid over the surfaces of the first two stories. While the dome was probably painted in deep blue, each coffer recessed plant panels displaying a star shape in imitation of the nighttime skies. Oculus is Latin for eye. Coffers were a sunken panel, often ornamental, in a vault or a ceiling. On sunny days, the oculus, or eye, served as a spotlight, admitting a bright shaft of sunlight that shone on the interior surfaces in the form of a huge golden disk that followed the trajectory of the sun and suggested the physical presence of soul in the daily lives of his worshipers. The oculus also provided ventilation. As a star-studded symbol of the heavens, the dome of the Pantheon also reminded visitors that the temple was dedicated to the seven planetary gods could look upon, who could look upon their worshipers. Those gods were Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the sun and moon gods, Sol and Diana. Used repeatedly as the core measurements of the Pantheon's design, the circle and spear were considered to be perfect and eternal geometric shapes that had no beginning and no end. The design must have pleased Hadrian, who no doubt regarded the Pantheon as a model, a microcosm of the actual empire over which he ruled. Further, because dome structures have historically served as venues for the gathering of people, it was a symbol of unity, a meaning which is still invoked in the architecture of our times by the many courthouses and capitol buildings crowned by domes. For example, the dome above the capitol in Washington, D.C. brings together the American people by uniting the two wings or branches of Congress the House of Representatives, and the Senate. Late Empire, 192 to 337 CE. This begins the decline of Roman power, which was in part a result of a stream of bad rulers. Authority was also being challenged. The economy was in decline and the efficient imperial bureaucracy was disintegrating. Commodus was a successor of Marcus Aurelius and was assassinated in 192, which marked the end of the High Empire. Christianity is beginning to make more of an impact. There was also a civil conflict with the new African emperor Severus. Severus was named the ruler of the Roman Empire and in doing so became Rome's first African emperor. From cremation to burial starts with Trajan and use of the sarcophagi, perhaps an influence of Christianity. And lastly we see a rejection of the classical style. Constantine ruled from 306 to 336. He invaded Italy in 312 and defeated and killed Maxentius and took over the capital with the aid of the Christian God. In 313, Constantine issued the Edict of Milan with co-emperor Licinius in the east 
which ended the persecution of Christians. Constantine kills Licinius in 324. He founds a new Rome, Byzantium, the new name Constantinople. He died in 337, where he was officially baptized. Arch of Constantine, Rome, Italy, 312 to 315 CE. This arch is located next to the Colosseum to commemorate Constantine's defeat of the Roman Emperor Maxentius. Builders, however, took much of the sculptural decoration from earlier monuments of Trajan, Hadrian, and Marcus Aurelius, and all the columns and other architectural elements date to an earlier era. In another Constantinian relief, the emperor distributes money and gifts to grateful civilians who approach him from right to left. Constantine is a frontal and majestic presence, elevated on a throne above the recipients of his generosity. Here you can read the inscription located on the Arch of Constantine. Here's one more detail from the arch. Here's an overview of the Roman Empire presented in a chart form. Thanks for watching. Change the game. Don't let the game change you. Macklemore.